We know the general form of an exponential function is represented by y equals ab to the power of x. That exponent contains the variable. We also know that a is the y-intercept of that function, and we know that b tells us whether or not it's a growth function or a decay function. If b is greater than 1, we have a growth function, and on that graph we're going to see that over time, generally speaking, we're rising to the right, we're increasing in value. If b is a number that is less than 1 but greater than 0, so basically between 0 and 1, we have what we call a decay function, where generally over time we're losing value exponentially, that graph is falling to the right. So knowing what we know about that, we can take a graph and generate the function of that graph based on what the graph looks like. We can take a look at the y-intercept and the value of that y-intercept is going to give us the a value that we can substitute into the function. And then we can take a look to see if it rises to the right or if it falls to the right. If it does so by a consistent amount, then we can pick out is it growth or decay and that gives us an indication as to what kind of a number we're looking for for that B value. In an example like this, we're given four different functions and we're asked to match those with four different graphs. So if we take a look at the graph, pay attention to the scale. So if this is zero and this is two, it means we're going up by a scale of one. So I know that this is a y-intercept of one, this is a y-intercept of one, this is a y-intercept of three, and this is a y-intercept of something less than one. So that is my a value. So if we take a look at this, a is the number that is not part of the power containing that variable exponent. So I know this is an a value of one, this is an a value of one third, this is an a value of three, and this is also an a value of one. So if I go ahead and put those in here, maybe let's just do this. So my a is one, my a is one, this is one, this is one, this is less than one, and this is three. Okay, well the only y-intercept of three is this particular equation here. So I know that that is the function that represents this graph. And then also take a look, not only do we have a y-intercept of three, this value of b indicates we have a decay function. So we know as the graph moves from left to right, it's falling as we go to the right, so that fits. This is the only one that has a y-intercept of one-third, and so this is my only one that's less than one. And again, take a look. This three indicates that we should be having a growth function, and sure enough, as we move to the right, we can see that the graph is growing. So maybe let's just do that. So that one goes with, we've got those two dealt with, so this is going to be number two. And that leaves us with two remaining graphs and two remaining functions. Now, both of the ones left, one and four, have a y-intercept of one. However, one is a growth function, one is a decay function. So if I take a look at this, I know this is my growth function here because I'm rising to the right. So that means that graph B rep is represented by function one. And then the last one is obviously going to be four, but take a look at this. We should have a y-intercept of one, which we do. We should have a decay function, which we also do. The graph is falling as we move to the right. Given coordinate points on a graph, we can also determine the function that corresponds to that graph. So in this particular one, we have two tables of values, and it helps some people just to rewrite the table. Instead of going horizontally, some people just like to see it vertically. It makes it easier for them to visualize, so it doesn't matter. But there's two things you're going to check. Number one, you're going to check your x values, and you're going to say, is x increasing one unit at a time? So we can see we're going 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So each time we're going up by one unit. And then we're going to take a look at the dependent variable and we're going to say what are we multiplying this by to get to my next value. And you have to check every single value to see if you're going up by a consistent amount. If there's one at the end that breaks rank and does not go up by a consistent amount, you cannot say that you have an exponential function. It has to apply to all of them. So we're going to say, okay, what are we doing with 7 to get to 14? Well, we're multiplying by 2. What are we doing with 14 to get to 28? We're multiplying by 2. If these get really tricky and you start getting decimal numbers or fraction numbers, 
Well, what else could we do with those numbers to see the multiplication factor? We could divide. So if you're not sure, go 14 divided by 7, and that gives you the number you're multiplying by. 56 divided by 28 gives you the number that you're multiplying by. So you can always kind of work backwards when you're doing that as well. If you happen to skip a number, so we know that we should go 4, 5, the next number should be 6, but let's say it's not at 7. That just means we've multiplied by 2 to get to 6, which isn't there, and then we multiplied by 2 again to get to the next number. So we've got two increases. So just be aware of that when we're trying to come up with this. Okay, so we know an exponential function in general form is that y equals ab to the power of x. We know we have a y-intercept where x is 0, so that 7 I can put in the place of a, and we know that we are increasing by a multiplication factor of 2 every single time. That makes it an exponential growth function, so I can put that in there as my b value. It is the base of that power. I've got the second example already written out as a table of values, and I've already picked out that y-intercept. That's usually the easiest thing to do, so we've got that in there. And now we're going to say, okie dokie, what are we multiplying this by to get to this? And we have to be multiplying. So clearly it's not going to be a whole number. If you can't easily get it, you've got a couple things you could do. You could go down here to the numbers that are a little bit smaller, and we could say, what are we multiplying 12 by to get to 3? Well, clearly it is one quarter. Now it's only exponential if we're multiplying by one quarter every time. So you could go in your calculator and take this number, multiply by 0 0.25 and check, do we get this number? And check everything. It's gotta fit every single time to be exponential. Or this is a case where you could always go and say, okay, if we divide them, take the number that follows, divide it by the number previous to that, and when you divide it, you're going to see that you do get a value of one quarter. So that means we're multiplying by one quarter. Check the same, uh, check the next two. Is it the same? Check the next ones. Is it the same? Check the next ones. Is it the same? And again, it's got to be consistent every single time. If it is, then we know we've got an exponential function. It's going to be decay in this case because we're losing value every time. So I've got my y equals my a value is that y-intercept, which occurs when x is 0. And my b value is the multiplication factor that we're multiplying every time. And again, remember, you have to have that exponent as a variable. That's what makes it an exponential function. The last piece we're going to touch on for today is Euler's number. So it's pronounced Euler, just think of your favorite hockey team. And we use a lowercase e to represent that number. It's a constant, just like pi is a constant for 3.1415, etc. Euler's number e represents approximately 2.718 and so on. It's irrational, there's no pattern to the decimals, it doesn't end, it goes on forever. And this is a number that comes up when we deal with natural logarithms, which we're going to get to in the next unit. It also comes up all the time in calculus. So we use this in growth functions where we have something that's increasing continuously. What you need to know for the purposes of what we're going to do today is that if we see an exponential function like this and we have an e here, we know that represents a value of 2.718. So that tells us b is greater than 1, making that a growth function. E is a button on your calculator right here, similar to pi is right there. So to get the value, you don't have to memorize it. If you press second function and then that divide sign, that's going to give you that 2.718. So you don't need to memorize the value. You can use your calculator to generate that. You're also going to notice on top of the natural log button, which we're going to get to, there is e to the power of x. So if we go second function and then press that natural log and then put an exponent of 1, you're going to get that same value there. Now look at this. I entered the value of e into my calculator, as many digits as my calculator would display. But look what happens over here. If I go 1 divided by 0 factorial, we know 0 factorial is 1. So this first fraction has a value of 1. 1 factorial is also 1. So we have 1 plus 1 is 2, plus 1 over 2, 
plus 3 factorial is 6, 1 sixth, plus 1 divided by 4 factorial, plus 1 divided by 5 factorial. I only entered up to this in my calculator. You would continue on with that pattern and look at how we can generate that Euler's constant. Some of the fascinating things we're going to start discovering here.